Good morning, church. Happy Easter. Uh, it's Pastor Jared here, and I, I am, I'm super excited about this morning, and I just I want to start off by saying thank you for joining us uh, for worship this morning. We, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of our King, and so it's, it's one of those days that is, as, as somebody who believes in Jesus Christ, man, I just get excited about what it is that we're going to walk through today. I, I'm just, I'm so stoked about, about how we're going to progress, and I, I'm looking forward to, to singing and, and hearing stories, and, and so I just, I, okay, so I got to get something out of the way. If you're going to have a brunch after Easter, now is the time to put your ham in the oven. Remember, it's like 375, about 16 minutes a pound. So them, them little boogers take a while to get up to about 130. So you're going to want to put that in now and do whatever else that you need to do so that we can focus on Christ. I want us to, to spend the next hour of our life just intentionally focusing on Christ. So, all right, we're going to be in Luke 24, 1 through 12. That's Luke 24, 1 through 12. And, and I, I want to say this. If you don't have a Bible or if you want a Bible, uh, we would love to send you one. We will mail you one for free. All I need you to do is on the, on the comments over there on the side, maybe type something in there that says, hey, I want a Bible uh, or PM us. You know, send us a, a message on Facebook or you can send us an email to the office. And, and the email address for that is DAC office at dallasalliance.org. If you send that email address an email and it says, hey, I'd like a Bible, we're going to need your address, uh, we will mail you one free of charge. We, we recognize and we see that the Bible is, is, a, is, is good for us. It's, it's where God reveals himself to us. It's, it's full of direction and instruction and, and, and just this story, this love affair that he has with us. And so we would love to get that out to you. Um, but we're, this morning, we're going to be in Luke 24. So before we, we read or dig in, I need to pray. I got I to gotta center myself. Uh, I'm super excited. So uh, let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you so much for the beauty of Easter. Even in, in all of the weirdness that it is this year, God, I thank you that we can still be one body, that we can come together, that we can, we can be in your embrace, God, and, and that, that your promise says we're two or more gathered. And God, I got to believe that as we gather as one, even if it's on a, on a device, Lord, you are here, your presence is with us, that your spirit is, is filling us. God, I thank you for that. Father, I, I pray this morning that, that, that the message, that the worship, that the stories, all of it, God, that it, it just, it, it is a, it's an aroma that is pleasing to you. As, as we're unpacking, God, this, this, this beauty of the gospel, Lord, I just pray that we, we can do it justice, Lord, I ask that it is received. And Father, I, I pray that, that it's, it's given to you. Father, let your kingdom grow. Let, let people hear you and experience you this morning. Father, do what only you can do in our hearts. Lord, soften us. Bring us to our knees. And let us worship you today. Lord, we, we love you and we trust you. And it is in Jesus' holy and precious name that, that we say this. Amen. Awesome. All right. So Luke 24. As, as, we're, as we're opening our Bibles, I just I kind of want to track back a little bit before we dig in. We, we need to remember that just days before Jesus was crucified, now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about the crucifixion and the mechanics behind it, but we can, we can rest assured that the men that were paid to be the, the deliverers of death, right? That's what they did. They were very, very good at their job. There's, there's really no question about whether or not the body, the, the humanity, the, the, the person of Christ, whether or not he died. People witnessed it. They mourned it. Nicodemus, right, he, he brings 100 pounds of, of myrrh and aloe. So they're, they're preparing a body. They entombed him. They, they put him in Joseph's tomb. They, they rolled the stone in front that, that, that really you shouldn't have been able to unpack. They buried him. He went from breathing to buried and, and, and really, none of this was questioned. On, on Friday, we, we had our Good Friday service where we, we recognize and we remember all that was done to him. And on Sunday, we step in to where we are in Luke 24. So Luke 24 says this, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, 
They went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanne, sorry, jo Joanna, and, and Mary, the mother of James, and this other woman, who we don't have a name for, with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stopping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. So I, I want us to start by recognizing that the very people that walked with Jesus, the, the, the disciples, the, the men and the women that Jesus, he, he taught them, he spoke to them. They would, have, they would have been able to remember his voice. They would have remembered his smell. They knew him as a person. They, he, they, they were given instruction by him. They, they were sent out into the world at one point to do miracles for him and through him. Yet, they did not believe him. In, in Luke 9.22, Jesus tells them that this is going to happen. He tells them in Luke 9.22 that he would be delivered to the hands of man, that he would be crucified, and that he would be resurrected from the dead. And they still didn't believe. They struggled with it. They, there was, there was, it was almost like it was a fable. It wasn't real. That is, until testimony was shared. See, there was a, a change in their perspective when they heard it from somebody else. It was the preaching of the gospel that started this transition of the world. Now, I know that some of us feel like we're not qualified to, to do that, to tell somebody else what God has done in our lives. And I want to say this. It was four very unlikely women that started that chain reaction. See, the thing is that, that if, if Jesus lived a perfect life, if he was, in fact, delivered over to man, if he was crucified, and if he did conquer death, and all humanity did, and all we did with that was walk away, then the church would have never been seated. Then, then souls would not have been impacted by the truth of the gospel. See, Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and this random other woman, and I, I really do feel bad that she doesn't get a name here, but the other woman, they took what God had revealed to them. They, they had this, this revelation about their salvation. See, they, they recognized the truth, and they shared it with the people that were closest to them. They, they took the gospel, and they fed it to the people that they loved. See, the thing is, Jesus was real, and, and, and he did die, and, and, and just like the disciples, we, I, a lot of you sitting at home, we've been given that truth. We know him, we, we've heard him, we, we wrestle with his words, we've seen miracles performed in his name, we know that he is our teacher. So the question that I have is, is, do you believe? I know we often ask that of people that, that don't attend church on a Sunday morning, but, but my question is those that come on a Sunday morning, do you actually believe? Or are you still walking up to the tomb expecting the body to still be there? See, the, the thing is, even the disciples needed to hear it. 
Even, even those, those apostles needed to be told that the tomb was empty. They, they needed proof of this resurrection, the salvation that comes from the body of Christ. And, and, and it was somebody else that led them to that. <laughs> it was four women. Why would your neighbor be any different? If, if, like the professional believers at the time, those that gave up their life to be with God, didn't believe him, why would your neighbor be any different? Why would the person at the grocery store be any different? Why would, why would somebody I work with be any different? Why would I be any different? Why wouldn't I need to have that same thing fed to me that those that knew him best needed? See, just days before, Jesus told them that his body would be broken. Just, just days before, he told them that his blood would be spilled, signing a new covenant for them. Just days before, he had told them that all of this was necessary for their forgiveness for their salvation, for this, this hope that is in their presence now, it's in our lives now, but it's also a hope for eternity. See, Jesus, he wasn't thinking about the here and now. He was thinking about the always. Yet, it wasn't until four women informed them that it had happened. It wasn't until then that they started to believe, right? Peter goes, wait, what? And he goes and he takes off and he, he's got, he's so, he's got to see. This is when they started to see the truth of that hope. This is when they, they started to recognize that Christ wasn't just this guy that walked around. Christ was their rescuer. And he came for them. And, and, and not only just them, but the good news and why it's so exciting to get out there is, is because he came for them and he came for us. He's an, an eternal offering. And it's an offering of salvation. So, so for the rest of service, and I know this is a little different than a normal Easter, but for the rest of service, we're going to sing some songs and we're going to hear some testimony. And, and here's my invitation to you as we walk through this as one body. Forget about the ham for a minute. Forget about all the noise and distraction that may be in your home or, or in your life and just lean in on God. Lean in on the truth that his body was broken for you. Lean in that that. Your sin required his blood to sign a new covenant with you. That, that his plan for you was always forgiveness. You just have to believe. And so my, my, my invitation is to lean and listen to the stories of the people that are going to talk about how God has completely impacted and changed their lives. I just I, I ask that you ask God for the same thing for you. So let's 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 pray and then let's let's watch. So if you guys bow your heads with me, Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the testimony you've offered me, God, for my life and how you have changed it. And, and honestly, God, I'm so excited for how you're continuing to change it, because I know that I still got some bumps and bruises to get through. Father, I thank you for, for Mary and, and Joanna and, and, and Mary and, and that other woman, God. You know who she is. I, I thank you that they were excited that the tomb was empty. Lord, I thank you that they recognized that, that you don't need us, God, but you want us to share that message. Father, that your church didn't die with you, that instead it exploded. So, Father, that's, that's my prayer, is that as we, as we listen to testimony and as we sing to you, God, that this is an opportunity for your church, for your kingdom, for your, your, your possession, us, to just explode. For us to, to multiply and, and to, to see people come to know you. And, Lord, not because we are perfect, but because of your perfect sacrifice, 
Lord, I, that's, that's, that's what I want. So, Father, uh, we, we just give this time to you, and I, I, I ask that this is an offering that you receive that is pleasant to you. Father, I trust that you will keep your promises, and, and I, I, I love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Jared has asked me to share my testimony this morning, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. I was raised in a Christian home, and I gave my life to Christ at the age of eight when I was also baptized, and I have followed him ever since. I met my husband Cliff when we were 17, and we married a year and a half later. And though many told us we were too young, here we are looking forward to celebrating our 48th anniversary next January. Along the way, we had two kids who married and gave us six grandkids, and just recently, we became proud great-grandparents to Micah. Cliff was called to preach when our kids were still small, and for a time, I truly believed that I was going to die. You see, I didn't think I could be a normal pastor's wife. I was right. I wasn't ever normal. But God used me in amazing ways anyway, maybe even because of it. We had a lot of ups and downs during our ministry, but God's grace was always with us. But what I want to share with you now is the way God worked in my personal life. I had a secret for many years. I was a closet alcoholic, and I also abused prescription drugs. This began when I was around 42 and continued until just over nine years ago. I became sober on January 20th, 2011. I am not proud of the person I became, when I was struggling with this issue. But this morning, I don't want to focus on the struggles. I want to focus on an incredible morning where God began a healing process in my life that had amazing consequences. For several years, we ministered together in the Nazarene Church, and one fall, we were attending a minister and mates retreat in Newport, Oregon. On the last day, I got up early and went down to the beach. It was one of those rare, beautiful days on the coast no wind, the sun was already up and actually shining, and it was fairly warm, especially for 7 a.m. I sat there for a while after reading the Bible and writing in my prayer journal, when I began to hear God speak to me. I can't say for sure it was audible words, but I heard actual words, and I could clearly understand what was being said. He began to point out things around me, asking me if I could see the mighty power of the waves hear the beauty of the bird song that morning, and feel the gentle breeze. I assured him I could see and sense all of it. And then he asked me, So witnessing my mighty power, do you believe I can heal you from your addiction and alcoholism? You see, I'd been begging him to do that for years. I always believed that if he wanted to, he could just remove this from me, and I would no longer live in fear and shame and regret. And what a testimony I'd have to share. I excitedly began to cry out over and over, Yes, God, I believe. I see the evidence of your vast authority all around me. My faith has obviously just been too weak to grasp your ability to do this for me. But now I believe you can and will heal me in an instant. And I sat there with my eyes closed, my hands raised, waiting to feel the healing take place in my mind, my body, and my soul. So imagine my shock when the next words I heard were these. Then, precious daughter, will you still trust me when I tell you I'm not going to? I have the power to heal you completely. I could accomplish this in a second, but this is not the path I'm choosing for you. I sat in stunned silence trying to digest and understand what I just clearly heard. And I waited, bewildered and hurt as I struggled with this. I knew beyond any doubt that what he was asking of me was real. I did not speak until I could be honest with God, for I knew this was a turning point in my life. Finally, knowing there was no point in trying to lie to him, in a tiny voice so unlike my joyous shouts of a few minutes earlier, I whispered, Lord, I don't understand, but yes, I will choose to trust you 
even in this. And nothing happened. There was no lightning bolt of understanding, no feeling of grace and peace. I was still so confused and hurt, but I knew with everything in me, I had to make that choice. Would I trust my God even in this? I think I was hoping that after I gave in, he would still miraculously heal me. I was hoping my obedience was all he really wanted, but that didn't happen. I continued to battle this for many years, and I hit the lowest point of my life in 2011 when I finally went to treatment and got serious about recovery. As I look back on the long journey and everything I put my family and friends through, I have come to know something deep in my heart. God did choose to heal me, and it started that quiet morning on the beach, but in his way, not mine. Along this road to recovery, I have been privileged to meet so many wonderful people, and God has given me a great compassion for others who struggle with this horrible disease and its devastating consequences. And without going through this, Cliff and I would never have had the opportunity to minister to others who have gone through this as well. So this morning, Easter Sunday, Resurrection morning, I want to encourage you wherever you are in your journey. Whether you are a long-time, steadfast, and faithful Christian, or brand new to this way of life, God will always meet you right where you are. He will always provide a way to escape temptation. He will always be with you. Even when his answers seem like the end of the road, it's often the very first step in an exciting adventure. May Jesus richly bless you this wonderful morning. Thank you for listening.
church come stand in the light the glory of god has defeated the night in all Good morning. My name is Jeff Sigmund, and I am a horrible person, but more on that in just a moment. I grew up in the church. I was a, I grew up, I am still a preacher's kid. My dad has since retired, but I'm a lifeline, lifelong preacher's kid. Uh, shout out to the preacher's kids. I know there's at least two of them that are watching this right now. We're awesome people. I uh, just, and so are you guys, so. But growing up in the church, I grew up pretty much in the second row. And I'd sit there with my mom, listen to my dad's sermons. Sometimes as a young child, I slept through them. Uh, try not to do that anymore. If I do, Jared, I'm sorry. Um, but I learned a lot about God and about the church and about living a Christian life during those, those formative years. And that, you know, so I grew up church in, in church, not just on Sunday mornings, but on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. And so we've kind of, we don't do that so much in the church these days, but growing up in that time in the 70s and 80s, that was a common thing. Now we've expanded it more into home groups. And again, I just want to challenge you, if you're not in a home group, join one. It's a great opportunity to strengthen your your life in Christ, but also to really get to know other people and uh, people that are you share life with. So, as I got older, I started going on visitations with my dad, and I remember that it was an awesome time. I just remember going in and visiting, you know, what we would call shut-ins at that time. You know, elderly people that couldn't get out of the house, but we'd pay visits to them. And then I remember. December of 1980. That's when I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized on December 10th, 1980. I remember that day well. This is a cold central Indiana day. And the heater in the baptistry wasn't working that well. That water was cold. But it was worth it. Because that was my dedication to my life, the beginning of my life truly in Christ. As I got older, I started doing more things in the church. I would, I joined youth groups. I helped teach uh, children's church occasionally. And that doesn't kind of sound like a horrible person, does it? Well, let me tell you about, more about me, the dark side of myself, my life. Uh, I began to allow myself to slide away. You know, we like to come up with these phrases that make it sound not so bad, slide away. But the fact is, I turned my back on God. I wanted to please other people rather than God. And I allowed sin to kind of control, take control of my life. Sin such as anger and food, uh, overeating, and one that I'm really ashamed of, pornography. Those are only the big three, um, and it's been an ongoing struggle. I drive Highway 22 every day, five days a week. That can get my anger worked up. Some of you are shaking your heads, I, can, I just know it. Uh, food, man, let me tell you, all this stuff that tastes good, like Karma Maple Bars, those aren't good for me, but they taste so good. 
and porn. There's all kinds of triggers. It'd just be a TV show. It could be an advertisement driving a billboard down the road. These things are affecting my life, and they control my life instead of me allowing God to control my life. So you see, that's why I say I'm a horrible person. I've disobeyed God. I've sinned, and I continue to sin. You know, Paul, Romans seven fifteen. I you know I really don't understand myself. For I, what I want to do is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I can really relate to Paul in that, and I can relate to another person in the Bible too, the prodigal son. I mean, here is a young man who had it all. His, he lived with his father, and his father had riches beyond measure. And yet, in selfishness, that said, I want what I want now. I want to do what I want to do on my own. And what did that man do? He went off. He, he abused the riches that he was given, his inheritance. And he threw it all away. For what? Selfishness and self-gratification. So I can really relate to that prodigal. And I understand when he finally came to his senses that, hey, you know what? I had it really good. My father is a great man. And he loved me. And I, you know, here I am. I'm eating with pigs. And so in the story of the prodigal, we see you know, the prodigal coming back to God. Or, or come back to his father. Um, we come back to God. It comes back to his father, and while he was a long way off, his father saw him. And what does the story say? The father ran to him. And so I just want to say, you know, what I learned about my own, my own life, my own, my own struggles, is that when I return to God, he doesn't sit there and think, waiting for me and say, I told you so. No, he comes running to me. And no matter the depth and breadth of our sins, no matter what we've done, God is always willing and waiting to run to us, waiting for us to come back. You see, I'm a forgiven child of God. Time after time, I have sinned. And I can't count the number of times that I've ran back, left, ran back, left, ran back. Maybe you're there with me. It's that cycle. But every time God wants us to come back and he's always waiting and ready to run to us. I'll close with one more scripture. Ephesians 2.10. I love the book of Ephesians. Especially the second chapter. But I particularly love Ephesians 2.10. And I'm going to read it from the Living Translation. And <clears throat> because there's one word I just love, I think the other translations miss. But let me read it from you for, for you from the New Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are God's masterpiece. Other translations say workmanship. I think that fails to capture the essence of that word and the essence of what God is doing in our lives. You see, he's creating us to be a masterpiece. His masterpiece. And that just speaks so much more volumes of his love for us. You see, we're all in this together. We're all being made perfect. And until that day when we're before that throne, when we are perfect, we're on that road, and we're going we're gonna to have times when we fall back and sin, but God's always there. He's always creating us, always still working on us, making us his masterpiece. covered my sin I believe I believe my 
my shame is taken away My pain is sealed in his name I believe I believe I'll raise a banner Cause my Lord has conquered the grave My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives My Redeemer lives I know He rescued my soul his blood has covered my sin I believe I believe My shame is taken away My pain is sealed in His name I believe I believe Sit on this mountain top to see your kingdom come. My redeemer lives. My redeemer lives. Oh, my redeemer lives. My redeemer lives. Yes, my redeemer lives. Oh, my redeemer. changed my life. Um, my story begins about three years ago. And when I say my story begins, I mean that's when God changed me. Um, so three years ago, I was at a pretty low point in my life. I was literally planning to kill myself. I was super depressed. Um, it was just a really dark point in my life. And right when I thought um, life was over, my um, now husband uh, came up to me and said, hey, uh, it's Easter, you wanna do something for the kids? I said, not really, I just wanna stay home. Well, he told me about this church that was throwing an Easter bash and I really didn't wanna go, but he said there was a llama, so that got me to go. I'd always wanted to pet a llama. Um, so I get there and I got to pet my llama and the kids are having fun and I'm getting fed up because there's a bunch of people there, and right when we get ready to leave, some guy comes up to me and said, hey, um, welcome, this is, what, this is our church, what can we do to improve your experience here? And I was like, I hate church people. <laughs> and so, of course, I got upset, and I was like, okay, let's, let's just kind of be a jerk to this guy. So I said, okay, well, if I went to your church, um, how many people would stick up their noses at me? How many people would judge me on the spot? Uh, I was just, my experience with churches has been horrible. And so he told me that, that none of that would happen. 
and he challenged me. He said, uh, come to my church tomorrow, come to our service, and I promise you, in fact, I guarantee you that nobody will judge you, and you will receive nothing but love. And so, of course, I was like, fine, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. So I, I come to church the next day, and uh, I walk in with this big old attitude, like, getting ready to prove this guy wrong. Turns out the guy was a pastor. And I was like, oh, crap. So I got really nervous, of course, because I just got spunky with the pastor of the church. And, um, well, he proved me right, and uh, I got nothing but love. Like, everybody was hugging and welcoming me, and it was the complete opposite of what I've ever experienced at a church. Um, keep in mind, I'm a single mom at this point. Obviously, I'm with a guy who I'm not married to, and at this point, I have, like, an inch long of hair and tattoos and... Everything is the, that is the epitome of the stereotype of what you don't want at your church. So um, I was really shocked when people welcomed me with open arms. And uh, later that day after the service, there was a, a free lunch being held and um, the outcast group was throwing a lunch. And that's when I heard testimonies and it changed my life from that moment on because I was like, holy crap, I'm not alone. Somebody else has gone through what I went through. Um, I'm not the only one who was abused as a kid. I'm not the only one who survived sexual assault. I'm not the only one who's a single parent. I'm not the only one who feels alone and abandoned and feels like nobody understands. Because believe me, somebody out there knows exactly what you're going through and you'll be shocked at how similar our stories are, no matter how alone you might feel. And uh, that's the day I, I learned the power of testimony Seeing how God changed somebody else's life changed mine. I went home that day in tears, and not because I was sad, but because I finally found somewhere I belonged. And, and since then, I, uh, God has really blessed me. I've gotten baptized. Uh, I have been able to restore the relationship with my parents. My, my children have found Christ and gotten baptized, and that's the biggest blessing I could ask for. I've gotten married. I finally got my own place. Just blessing after blessing that I never thought would be able, I would be able to accomplish happened. And I thank Christ every day for a new blessing. And, and so if you don't know Christ today, I, I urge you, please, please pick up that Bible or, or come to church or even just watch this video, I don't care. But take the time to talk to him because I guarantee you it'll be worth it. Hey family, so I, I hope that the testimony that you heard, I, I hope that it inspires you. I hope that you heard the truth of what their lives are, are doing, how it's not just this one and done thing, but that there's this, this salvation moment and that God is continuing to walk with them now. His rescue is for the here and now. And, and I, I want you to hear this, that because the tomb is empty, because Jesus has conquered death, people are changing because it's his plan to do so. That because he's, he's offering his spirit to us, we have an opportunity to grow with him, to walk with him, to, to learn to be like him. And the kingdom of God is growing. So I, here's, here's my challenge to you if you're watching. One, first and foremost, if you're hearing this kind of message and maybe you're trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is or maybe you've, you've heard it a thousand times and you're at a place where you're like, okay, I need this, I want this in my life, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to, to, to email the church, I need you to send a comment in, in Facebook, I need you to, to, to send me a private message, I don't care, but you need to contact me. Now let's talk. Let's, let's walk through the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Because the tomb is empty. And, and the rescuer has, has been given to you. All you have to do is say yes. And, and so here's, here's my other challenge is this. Is if, if you remember none of, 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 of us, none of us are perfect. We're all flawed. We, we all fall short. But, but the beauty of the gospel is, is that we've been rescued from that and we're continuing to be rescued 
through that. So, so here's, here's my invitation to you, church family, whether you call Dallas Alliance your home or not, I don't care. We are family. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here's my invitation to you. Right now, you are watching this, this, this broadcast. That's what it is. You're watching this on a platform that largely gets abused. And so what I want to I ask of you is this. Let's blow it up with beauty. Let's blow it up with transition in life, with, with change. Let's, let's blow it up with those that don't need to go and look at the empty tomb. Let's share our stories. So, so in, in just a minute, we're going to be done. And, and what I want you to do is, let's be real, most of you have smartphones, is pull your smartphone out. You know how to take a selfie, so put it on selfie mode. And I want you to record a one to three minute video about how God has changed your life. And I want you to put it on Facebook, and I want you to tag Dallas Lions Church when you do it. Let's, let's make Easter an opportunity for the world to hear the gospel. This, this message that we're having right now, this conversation is only going to go so far. And there's, there's people out there that need Mary and Joanna and Mary and the other woman. They need people like you to go out and to say, hey, the tomb is empty. There are people in this world right now that are desperate for hope and a rescuer. And we have one in our fingertips to share with them. And so that's it. Those are, my, those are my challenges. If you want to know who he is, get a hold of me. And if you know who he is, tell somebody about it. I know some of us aren't very video savvy on our cell phones. That's all right. We know how to write things. Testimony doesn't always have to be in video. But we do have an opportunity where we are in the midst of all of this watch the kingdom grow that's why Jesus died he didn't die so that humanity would then go well that was neat he died so that humanity would get to know him and so I am asking for you to share that with the world around you let's pray Father God, I, I, I thank you so much for today, Lord. I thank you for an Easter service, even though it looks weird. Uh, God, I just thank you that you, you just pour this blessing upon me, God, and that you pour just blessings upon your children. Father, I thank you that your spirit's eagerly and actively praying for people that need to know you. God, I, I just, I, Father, I just, I pray that as, as, as your body responds, God, as we become your hand and feet, as we, like those four women, we share that message, God, I pray that people hear your truth. Father, the people, they get to meet you, that they get to know you, that they, they get to wrestle with you. Father, I, I pray that people get to experience you. And they get to join you. And Lord, just, we love you. And Father, it's in your, your beautiful and your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Family, I, I, I really hope you have a wonderful Easter. Enjoy your brunch. Let's make a quick movie. And let's, let's watch our testimony change the world. I love you guys. Happy Easter.